Italy. For much of its history, it was not a united country, but instead a collection of rival city-states and small monarchies. Let's look at just who these major players were during the height of the Italian Renaissance. The birthplace of the Renaissance, the Republic of Florence was the foremost banking power in all of Italy and perhaps Europe, so much so that the Florentine currency, the uh, creatively named Florin, became a universal one for transactions across the continent. This wealth and inspiration from a period of severe crisis in the 1300s is what led to the unique, more secular characteristics in the works of contemporary Florentines Donatello, Brunelleschi, and Bruni, who then spread the ideas to others in the Florentine region and later all of Italy. The Republic was oligarchical, ruled by a council called the Signoria, composed of noble families and chosen indirectly by the leaders of the city's guilds. The Medici family had established what was at one point possibly the biggest bank in Europe, and eventually gained de facto control of the city, with the support of the Signoria, in 1434 under Cosimo de' Medici. His grandson Lorenzo lets the bank stagnate and crumble, but he proved to be an effective leader of the city-state and one of the most prominent patrons of Renaissance art. Eventually, the Medici grew their power in Europe, tallying up two queens of France and four popes. They continued to rule Florence informally until 1532, and were only interrupted twice by popular revolts. Only the first is even really important because a friar named Savonarola takes advantage of the crisis of a French invasion to take over the city in 1494, and once he's in charge, he demands a puritanical reform of the church and society. He burns a bunch of secular books and art in the process, and eventually... The people get sick of him and burn him alive in 1498. I think he's certainly comparable with Oliver Cromwell, but he's more important as a precursor to the Reformation, which would happen just 20 years later. Anyway, in 1532, Pope Clement VII, himself a Medici, gives the family the hereditary title Duke of Florence and makes their rule official. Later, they expand to the south, and the Grand Duchy of Tuscany instead is created for them. And after the Renaissance, they just kind of do pretty okay for a while. They slowly decline relative to the new Atlantic powers until they are eventually conquered by Piedmont Sardinia in their quest to unify Italy. Milan's city-state is a bit more traditional. It's a regular hereditary duchy. Its location is one of the main reasons for this, as it borders larger regional power Switzerland and great power Austria, not to mention close proximity to France. All that necessitates a strong, decisive, one-man government with a strong military. The Duchy of Milan was originally ruled by the Visconti family, but in 1447 one of them died without an heir. There were two prominent claimants, the King of Aragon, and a mercenary captain, also known as a condottiero, Francesco Sforza. Naturally, the people picked neither of the two options, and instead formed the Golden Ambrosian Republic, inspired by the relative success of their republican neighbors Venice, Genoa, and Florence. Venice didn't like the radical nature of this republic. It granted too many civil liberties. So, they declared war on them. Sforza originally agrees to fight on Milan's behalf in exchange for a prominent position in the government, but then several disaffected members of the new Milanese government break deals with him and betray him, so he switches sides and eventually takes the city of Milan by force. Declared Duke of Milan in 1450, and he is officially recognized by Venice at a peace conference in 1454. So that's how the Sforzas came to power in Renaissance Milan. After Francesco, the most notable one of them is Ludovico Sforza, who ruled during the last and most successful part of the Milanese Renaissance, sponsoring works like Da Vinci's The Last Supper. Unfortunately for him, he made an unsuccessful bid to defeat his rival in Naples by asking the French to do it for him. The French passed through Milan on their way down to Naples, and they're like, hey, we should take this too. So they take that too and they kick out Ludovico, who then calls the Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor, and asks him to kick out the French. And that's how the Italian Wars, or the Habsburg-Valois Wars, start. 
Milan stagnates after that point. It flips between Habsburg and Valois hands for a while, but eventually winds up in 1559, firmly under Habsburg Spanish control. The Papal States were the collection of domains in Italy, with a couple exclaves in France, notably Avignon, under the direct authority of the Pope. Obviously, he still ruled, you know, feudally through minor nobles, but nevertheless, that spiritual leader was one of the most important secular rulers in Italy, fighting wars, collecting taxes, and signing treaties. As a result of this secular focus, the papacy during this time was rife with corruption and nepotism, perhaps most infamously under the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI. The popes were also collectively perhaps the biggest patrons of Renaissance art in a quest to rebuild the glory of their capital city of Rome. For example, Pope Julius II, known as the warrior pope because he pursued an aggressive foreign policy and actually led troops into battle at least twice, also patronized the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica, Michelangelo's painting of the Sistine Chapel, and Raphael's painting of several rooms within the Vatican, most notably the School of Athens. Corruption came with this glory. In order to pay for these ambitious building projects, popes used often questionable means, especially the sale of indulgences. It reaches a breaking point under Pope Leo X when Martin Luther triggers the Protestant Reformation. To the south was the largest state in Italy by land area at the time, the Kingdom of Naples, which by a series of dynastic events was actually technically called the Kingdom of Sicily, despite not controlling Sicily. And it was certainly a regional power, but it was usually under the thumb of one foreign monarchy or another. And it was more agricultural than the north and as such not quite as wealthy despite the relative size. During this time, the kingdom was still wealthy and was able to do plenty of Renaissance patronage, but it had peaked in the 1200s and was on a slow downward trend, a trend which continues to this day. The south of Italy remains much poorer than the industrialized north causing regionalism and other secessionist issues. Anyway, the, the kingdoms of France and Aragon, later Spain, competed for the Neapolitan crown, with Aragon slash Spain usually holding power and solidifying it under their domain by the end of the Italian Wars in 1559. We should probably talk about Aragon, since they're very influential in Italy and throughout the Mediterranean during this time period. Now, you might be saying, hey, what's an Aragon? Well, here it is. And this is a map of all the territory its king controlled at one point or another. They have kind of a, a weird system. The kingdom of Aragon itself doesn't really expand. The kings just kind of acquire more duchies and kingdoms and then label it all under the crown of Aragon. It's, it's weird. Anyway, just for some background, in Spain this time there were two kingdoms, Aragon and Castile. In 1469, Ferdinand II of Aragon marries Isabella I of Castile, and then you come to know them as Ferdinand and Isabella, the Catholic monarchs and rulers of Spain. The two crowns emerged to form the actual united de facto kingdom of Spain in 1516. Anyway, Aragon obtained the islands of Sardinia and Sicily, which is barely on the map to the south, through conquest during the 1200s and 1300s, and Naples was later acquired dynastically in the 1400s. This was the beginning of Spanish conquests in Italy, and for hundreds of years, they were the predominant force on the peninsula. The Republic of Venice was the Italian superpower of the day during the Renaissance. They had one of Europe's biggest and most feared navies and an extensive domination of the then-lucrative Mediterranean trade with the East. Their navy was used as the primary means of transporting all the crusaders and their equipment to the Levant, and they were major instigators of the sacking of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade, a move which strategically allowed them to knock out the Byzantines, one of their rivals for trading power in the area. Their other main rival was the Republic of Genoa, to whom they initially lost heavily in conflict. That's when the Genoese took Marco Polo prisoner. But after about a hundred years, they eventually won crushing the Genoese navy in 1380 and cementing their position of dominance. The leader of Venice, the Doge, was elected by the Republic's primary legislative body, the oligarchical Great Council, composed of aristocrats and wealthy merchant families. Despite what the name Republic might make you think, Venetian society was in fact very rigid, with a stable and defined hierarchy. Few families entered or exited the ranks of the nobility, as listed in the Golden Book, 
and only upon great deliberation. During the Renaissance, Venice was Europe's preeminent thalassocracy, and as such, it became another large center for art and patronage. The city produced unique artists like Titian, and due to its former occupation of the Byzantine heartlands and its ties with the East, it was the gateway for humanist learning based on the texts of the ancient Greeks and Greco-Romans so characteristic of the Renaissance. The city-state peaked in 1509 after the Genoese Pope Julius II decided to restrain Venetian expansion by uniting not only France, but also the Holy Roman Emperor and Spain behind him. It's called the War of the League of Cambrai, part of the Italian Wars. Naturally, it's overkill, and Venice's army gets totally shredded. But then the alliance collapses, and everyone switches sides, and Venice makes it out unscathed territorially, but really bruised militarily, and they start to stagnate and crumble after that instead of expanding. The other main reason for that is because the center of trade is shifting from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, meaning a whole lot of lost income for the Republic. As a result, it slowly loses possessions until it is conquered by Napoleon. Genoa, based in the region of Liguria, is the other primary maritime republic at this time, with Venice as its famous rival. They even have a similar government structure with a doge and everything. It peaked in the late 1200s, having defeated its rival Pisa at sea, and enjoying exclusive trading rights with a restored Byzantine empire, dominating the spice trade in the Black Sea and controlling a significant amount of territory along the route there and back. You'll notice that the Venetian and Genoese quote-unquote empires don't look like normal empires because they've just got a bunch of small islands and naval bases. That's because these are trading empires. They aren't interested in controlling vast swaths of land and dealing with the logistics and manpower that that would cost, taxation, policing, you name it. Instead, those islands and small bases serve as perfect way stations for trade fleets and outposts and depots to serve as trading centers with the locals. Anyway, Genoa maintained this position of power and prestige until that aforementioned crushing naval defeat in 1380. Afterward, they enter a period of decline, and between the mid-1400s to early 1500s, are under near-constant French occupation and pillage during the Italian Wars. Eventually, an incredibly skilled Genoese admiral and benevolent virtual dictator named Andrea Doria successfully allies himself with the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain, Charles V, to liberate Genoa from the French. Afterwards, Genoa becomes a sort of little partner to Spain in financing their ventures in the New World. As a result, their banker-capitalist class becomes quite prosperous, and the city makes somewhat of a comeback, but only for as long as Spanish prosperity lasts. Once they start to fall apart in the 1600s, Genoa declines again as well. One last important note about Venice and Genoa was their significant impact in the era of exploration. Many of their expert sailors, like the Genoese Christopher Columbus or the sort of Genoese, sort of Venetian John Cabot, were hired by the colonial powers as explorers and were very successful. Additionally, the Venetians and the Genoese were the ones to develop the techniques of chattel slavery, trading from the Black Sea to the Middle East, that would later be used much more infamously in the Americas. During the Renaissance, the Duchy of Savoy's proximity to France mostly prevented Renaissance-style prosperity. It was repeatedly fought over and occupied by the French during the Italian Wars, who had ambitions to conquer the territory as a gateway to Italy. Eventually, at the end of the Italian Wars, Savoy reconsolidated and created a well-trained, well-commanded, and native Savoyard military. At the end of the War of Spanish Succession, they gain control of the Kingdom of Sicily, which they trade, as you do, for the Kingdom of Sardinia to form what is generally called the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, which would go on to unify Italy in 1860 in the Risorgimento. And here we have all the little guys with similar histories to the other states. The little ones over there in the northwest get integrated into Savoy, eventually the ones in the center north wane but survive until Napoleon. San Marino is still around and the world's oldest surviving independent sovereign state and constitutional republic, having been founded in 301 AD, avoiding the conquest of the Pope, Napoleon, and the Kingdom of Italy, all through agreements and personal friendships. Siena gets conquered by Spain and given mostly to Tuscany. Ragusa over in the east gets vassalized by the Ottomans. So 
Yeah, Italy's history is pretty turbulent, full of internal conquest and external conquest. It's during this instability that many of those who would become the first Renaissance artists, like Donatello, came of age and grew more skeptical of everything than their predecessors, and that, followed by 40 years of relative peace in which they could actually do art instead of fighting, in addition to the influx of Greek texts, etc., etc., very well may have given rise to the Renaissance we know today.